one of the benefits uh, having this type of engineering work and research under one roof. Right? It's like, because it's mutually beneficial. You know, we try to solve something, we have an idea, we write it up, maybe in a technical report, and then we get the feedback that this doesn't work in, in practice, right? It works in, in paper world, but not, <laughs> not out there. And uh, this is very fruitful. Let's be honest, what do we do with our papers? Or what do we do to our papers? <laughs> <laughs> to, yeah. um, well, that's a good question. Actually, we, we, we need to do a, a lot of different things. Uh, well, first of all, to me, it's really a translation process because we are not researchers. And that's really, I think we, 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 we should emphasize that there are different skills involved. It's not the same thing. I mean, we are all in the same domain of problem space, but we all have different skills. I think it's very important to emphasize the fact that all, those skills are all relevant to, the, to, to solving the problem. And so getting from the paper, I think <clears throat> the, the, the very first step uh, we do is to try to get an overall idea of the, of, the, of the protocol. And I think this is concretely for us engineers, it's really building a prototype. I think the first thing, like most engineers, and I think that all engineers will agree, would agree with me, is if it's not in code, you don't understand it. Because it means like, when, when it's in code, then you, you, can, you can really start touching the thing, right? really start playing with it. And so what we, what in the case of Peras, that was really, in the very, very first days, uh, even before the paper was, even existed, was written, there was just, you know, some informal or semi-formal specification or the protocol. And, and then we really tackled that and started writing some code that could first fully represent the protocol. Uh, then put this code, which was supposed to be an analog of the protocol, into a simulated environment, trying to understand how, how the various part will flow. So in the case of Paris, for example, there is the key, uh, the key ingredient in Paris is really this, uh, this whole voting thing. The nodes in the protocol will vote for the, for the blocks and decide whether, I mean, and decide and add weight to the blocks. And so that's uh, that. But how does it feel in practice? And how do you do that in practice? And that's where we also wanted to pull some uh, some some previous work we did on the Delta Q model, on Ouroboros in general, and really trying to model in the small the prototype itself, but also model the network behavior at large and understand how the flow of data goes through the network and what will, what would be the impact on the existing Ouroboros. And that's where we were, we were alluding to it uh, several times, but that's where this idea of the initial version of the protocol where we had basically um, the certificates were supposed to be uh, part of the block headers and, and diffuse across the network. We really, we saw very quickly that it couldn't fly because there, there's a stringent constraint on the delay when you want to, to move blocks around. So there is really, they're really working on these two levels, uh, the, the prototype code, trying to simulate it, and then high level model. So that's really the, the, the very first steps we did. And then there is a refinement process that, that goes over. Yeah. That's very important. Refinement is, mm. is kind of... Uh, By the way, uh, what the is this Delta Q model? I'm not sure I actually understand <laughs> what it does. I really? just hear it mentioned all the time. Yeah, I know it's so, somehow related to the network. So we have a whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's really not... I mean, Delta... So it's, it's something... It's a model that's been built over the years by uh, various people from, uh, from the networking team in, uh, in, at IOG and then in, in, in Falcano. Conceptually, you can imagine uh, Delta Q as a way to uh, model the some 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 resource or, or some some property of the of the network, like the the one that we cared about in in the case of Car Cardano and the others is once a, once a block is produced, how much time does it take for this block to reach all the nodes in the network? And you could simulate that um, like by code, but Delta Q is a way to model that analytically by saying, okay. For a block to go from one node block producer to reach all the nodes, it, this block has to reach, there, there are several stages. So in the case of blocks, for example, you say, okay, I'm going to send a header. This header is going to be pro propagated across, the, across the, the, the network. And then how do you propagate the, net, the header? Oh, well, you, you say uh, in practice, what happens is that a node say, oh, I have a new header. Then all the, all the, the peers of the node say, oh, I'm interested in that new header which means like there is one communication, one, one way communication, then the other way, then you say, okay, I get the header. And then now once you have, once you have the header, say, oh, I want the body. So you model the, the process and then the key, the key ingredients is for each step of the process, you attach a probability distribution to say, okay, here is the, uh, the probability distribution of the resource of interest. In our case, it's time. 
So the, the probability distribution of what's the probability distribution for the time to, to go from one node to the other, then from one node to all the other nodes, then across the network. And what you get is typically you get a, a kind of S-shaped distribution that says, okay, given my model, I can assess that 95% of the, uh, of the block headers will reach the nodes under three seconds, which is actually our uh, stringent constraint in Covenant now. Mm -hmm. And this is what Delta Q allows you to do, is really modeling the, uh, the, the propagation of the, of the data, uh, the, modeling the network, but at the very abstract level, and trying to, I think the, the, the way that uh, Neil, uh, Neil Davis, who is the, one of the inventor of this, uh, this methodology, uh, puts it, is trying to prune down the exploration space before having to even build a simulation or a prototype. And that's why it's interesting. It's an interesting model to explore. And this is why we started using, I mean, we, it was kind of used before, but not formalized. And that's what, that's what's interesting also in, uh, in Peras as a good example is how we are using that as a kind of, you know, a test bed or an improvement of what we did before. Well, I think it's um, basically what you are describing is also very interesting because it's not something that we have invented, actually. Uh, this idea of taking a research outcome, not, not only a paper, but it might be just any, any technical report or any yes, idea that is course, formalized, yeah. formalized enough so that we can work on, and moving it to different step until we reach the implementation in production is something that you mentioned it uh, already, is using the software readiness level, so following a scale of evolution of the maturity of software that goes from research ID to implementation in production, passing through different phases that are basically validating the property in a simulated environment, validating the property on a, on a prototype in a simulated environment as well, validating, validating it on a relevant environment, and then we, we continue acquiring knowledge and certainty about what we are building so that we can smoothly move to towards the implementation. And obviously, again, the, the formalization of all this is also important because there are many stuff where we need to simulate stuff. There are some areas where we need to prove stuff, to prove that, well, it's what you said earlier, to prove that the things that we have checked manually, it can be checked also by a computer to be sure that the property held and will hold every time in production. And actually, I'm interested <laughs> into your, your view of this process because basically you give, us a, you give us a research ID and then we do stuff with it and you see some of the outcome of it. So what, what's the value on your side of the spectrum actually? So having this, these insights, I mean, this is very beneficial to, to read. I mean, this is one uh, kind of one of the benefits uh, having this, this type of uh, engineering uh, work and research on, under, one, under one roof, right? It's like, because it's mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we, you know, we try to solve something, we have an idea, we write it up, maybe in a manuscript, uh, maybe in a technical report. Uh, and then we get the feedback that, you know, this, is, this doesn't work in, in practice, right? It works in, in paper world, but not, <laughs> not out there. And uh, this is very fruitful uh, because and, and it, this, this exchange is, is, uh, is very important if you want in the end to do something that sh it should be practical and have an impact. And, and in our case, impact means the innovation. We, 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 we say, okay, this is something that, for example, the Karkidana community should adopt then we are confident that this so, is feasible and it's good. 